You know, I like to think of myself as someone who's mostly interested in the international relations aspect of history, especially when it comes to the European Union, which is why I've already got a bunch of videos on that topic. So I always looked at the Eurovision Song Contest as a thing I can use to prove my point that countries like Serbia and Moldova are a lot more modern than you might expect, while countries like Hungary have a lot of catching up to do. I'll be honest, I hadn't actually watched any Eurovision contest in full when I made my video on it, only some snippets of notable performances. But this year, I sat down and watched both semifinals and the grand final to completion. And let me just say, wow, I've been missing out. I must have watched all of these performances at minimum five times. I've seen so many YouTube videos about it. I've analyzed the voting patterns completely and I immediately regret everything I said in my previous video. And I feel like the only way to clear me of my sins is to make a video essay. Following Russia's exclusion from the ESC in the wake of the invasion of Ukraine, the pro-Russian hacker group Killnet launched a couple attacks on Italian websites during the contest of last year, since it took place in Italy. Thankfully these attacks failed, but it does show that Russia would allow these kinds of groups to interfere with the contest. Russia did indeed do something this year, but I'll get back into that later. So even with Ukraine's Kalush Orchestra being victorious, the security concerns were enough to convince the European Broadcasting Union to not hold the contest in the winning country. Runner-up UK was allowed to take over the torch in their stead. Initially there was a lot of critique on this from Ukraine's previous winners, although it was supported by the public broadcasting company of Ukraine. And so we moved all the way to Blighty. 20 cities in the UK expressed interest in hosting the event, which was reduced to 7 in the long list and 2 in the short list. Particularly London wasn't chosen because the BBC wanted to not host everything in the capital. Between Liverpool and Glasgow, Liverpool was chosen to host the event in the Liverpool arena. The presenters were chosen to be British singer Alicia Dixon, British actress Hannah Waddingham, Ukrainian singer Julia Sanina, and Irish television host Graham Norton. Alicia has experience being a television presenter, and Graham has been the BBC's commentator for Eurovision since 2009. So those two make sense to bring along for the show to go smoothly. Julia and Hannah, however, probably have some undertones. Julia was chosen to create a link to Ukraine, furthering the theme of this year and also reminding the audience of the reason why we're in the UK to begin with, the war. Hannah, on the other hand, is a fan of languages and can fluently speak French and Italian. She even shows this off by saying this before each show. Que vous ne pouvez pas voter pour votre propre pays, as well as... You see, Europe, some of us Brits do bother to learn another language. <laughs> is nudging you in the direction of we deserve to host in Ukraine's place because we actually know a damn thing about Europe. Well, Britain, I'm glad you've decided to take Eurovision more seriously after Sam Ryder got you a second place last time. And considering how everyone in the community loves Hannah now, I'd say it succeeded. This year's theme is United by Music, with the main artwork featuring some hearts with the colors of the flags of Ukraine and the UK in the shape of an electrocardiogram. They really went all out in that regard, since the postcard for each song not only featured the singing country, the host country UK, but also Ukraine. I guess the EBU thought that there technically being two hosts was a good way to increase tourism income by times 1.5 compared to every other contest. You know, at least if most of these places in Ukraine are even safe to travel to. In total, 37 countries participated, with the notable exceptions of Bulgaria, Montenegro and North Macedonia, who have been regular joiners. Financing the competition became difficult for them due to the ongoing energy crisis. And as for Bulgaria, their political crisis probably had something to do with it as well. Then there are still other countries who haven't participated in a while for different reasons. Bosnia and Slovakia because they lack finances, Hungary and Turkey because they're homophobic, and Russia and Belarus because take a guess. But hey, Luxembourg finally got over their skill issues and is coming back next year. So with that introduction out of the way, here are the subjects of today's video. Most of these first sections will be about each country's song and how well they ended up doing. But for the audience who only cares about geopolitics, the last couple sections are about the points that were given out, as well as some fun statistics for the nerds among... Viewers. Allocation actually mattered a lot this year, since Eurovision decided to change the way voting worked this year in two different ways. Before, there were two semi-finals and one grand final, and in all of them the votes were split 50-50 between a jury of music experts and the televote of the entire nation. This time, however, the semi-finals will only count televotes, while the 50-50 system was kept for the grand final. This means two things. First, performances that aren't very flashy or memorable, even if they have good vocals, will have a tough time qualifying in the semi-final, since the televote tends to favor interesting performances. This is why ballots especially have to be careful this year. Second, the performances that are placed earlier on in the running order are less remembered by the televote, so those also have a lower chance of qualifying. That's something that usually doesn't obstruct the jury vote, but the public sometimes lacks object permanence. The other way in which the voting system was changed was the introduction of a rest of the world vote, meaning that citizens from any country outside of the participants could vote. Admittedly, this likely won't change anything too drastically since Europe is a speck compared to everything else. Still worth considering though. 
Anyways, the official allocation draw was held on the 31st of January in order to decide which countries participated in which semi-final and if they would perform in the first or second half of it. Each country is split up between five different pots in order to prevent what Eurovision calls neighborly voting. There are six countries in each pot and three in each of them will go into one semi while the other three will go into the other semi. Basically, this was implemented because Western Europe whined hard enough. The pots have been around since 2008 and have always had their own identity, sort of. So let's compare them with the pots of last year. Pot 1 has mostly Balkan countries, although with the absence of Montenegro and North Macedonia, it shifted slightly northwards towards Switzerland and Austria. Pot 2 is a Nordic pot, including Australia, because they have no fans. This year they picked up Estonia because 37 is now perfectly divisible by 6. So this will be the only time Estonia is Nordic. Pot 3 is a former Soviet bloc that also often includes Israel because they have no fans. Since Russia was in last year before getting banned and Ukraine automatically qualified this year, the Caucasus countries had to pick up Latvia and Lithuania. Pot 4 is a Mediterranean pot, including Ireland because they have no friends. The only difference here is that because of Bulgaria's absence, Ireland was put in here instead. Pot 5 and Pot 6 are always wildcard pots, although this year only had the fifth one. It's kind of a combination of the bipolar relationships between Belgium and the Netherlands, Poland and Czechia, and Romania and Moldova. In the end, the nations participating in the first half of the first semi-final were Croatia, Ireland, Latvia, Malta, Norway, Portugal and Serbia. The second half has Azerbaijan, Czechia, Finland, Israel, Moldova, the Netherlands, Sweden and Switzerland. The first half of the second semi-final has Armenia, Belgium, Cyprus, Denmark, Estonia, Greece, Iceland and Romania. And the second half has Albania, Australia, Austria, Georgia, Lithuania, Poland, San Marino and Slovenia. The big five and winner Ukraine automatically advance to the finals, but are also allowed to vote on one semi-final based on another draw. France, Germany and Italy can vote in the first semi, while Spain, Ukraine and the UK can vote in the second semi. It's not like block voting actually decides the whole winner or anything, but let's look at some pairs who were separated and would thus have a harder time. Belgium and the Netherlands, Moldova and Romania, Latvia and Lithuania. It also meant that Italy couldn't vote for San Marino, Spain couldn't vote for Portugal, the UK couldn't vote for Ireland, and France couldn't vote for Armenia, all of which are also often couples. Obviously there are some winners as well, like Croatia and Serbia, Finland and Sweden, Cyprus and Greece, and Ukraine could give votes to Poland. Thanks to the semifinals being televote only now, it really increases the chances of a performance getting screwed over by the running order. But I think there's only one country who particularly suffered from that this year. But with that over with, let's see what was submitted. From now on, I'm gonna show off all of the performances, which may include some flashing lights. I've tried to keep it at a minimum, but if you're not into that, then do be careful. The first semi-final took place on the 9th of May, and it featured... Songs. I know, it's pretty insane. For this section, I want to give a brief overview of each song, what they're about, and how well they did. Unfortunately, I am both easily impressed and don't know anything about music, so I definitely can't do any of these performances justice in a short description. If you want to get an actually good overview of any of these songs, then I recommend checking out some other creators. Overthinking It has a couple great analyses of the hidden meanings behind some of the songs, and Eurovision Histories has some videos rating each performance. They're a lot more nerdy about this than me, so you should go check them out as well. Also, Overthinking It made this beautiful thing called the Eurovision Voting Explorer, which analyzes points given for almost every contest so that they can be compared to other countries. It's amazing, make sure to check it out. Also, I'm gonna assume that you've already watched all of these so that I don't have to show them, because YouTube will kick down my door in a couple months to silence those parts of the videos. Anyways, let's begin. First up is Norway's Queen of Kings, a powerful electropop song about women empowerment and loving yourself in general, inspired by Alessandro's experiences with being bisexual. Alongside that, it's got some sea shanty sentiments, just a little more modern. It qualified in the first semi-final at 6th place and ended up getting a very high 5th place in the grand final. It's a pretty large difference since there's even more countries in the grand final, but again, the running order has a very large effect on the song's placement. In this case, Norway had to go first in the semi, but 20th in the grand final, which is like the most favorable jump in the whole show. While their jury vote was pretty bad, the televote is what pulled them to such a high placement, where they got the third most amount of votes, only behind the other two popular Nordics. Alongside the favorable running order, it gives off the perfect hashtag slay energy that made it really popular on Spotify and especially on social media. But I don't know, I stay far away from such platforms at all times. Back in my day, we used to call it epic, but I guess times are a-changing. Anyways, Norway's high placement was pretty deserved, it was indeed epic. Second is Malta's Dance Our Own Party, a smooth funk song about wanting to escape a party and just listen to music. Their own party, you might say. It's sung by the group The Busker, an indie pop group putting the saxophone at the forefront, alongside having some 80s visuals and even pixelated versions of themselves. Okay, that's kinda cute. It failed to qualify for the finals, and in the first time I final, it got... Last place? 15th out of 15? No, this is one of my favorites. 
Okay, listen, I'm a complete sucker for both jazzy music and gaming aesthetics. Just listen to any background music I put in my videos. And because I also don't go to parties. But I'm sure you all expected that of me anyways. And that created the perfect storm to sweep me off my feet and apparently nobody else. Or you know, if I had feet. Remember like two minutes ago when I said that one country in particular got robbed by the running order in the semis? Yeah, it's this one already. In hindsight, the Eurovision crowd just wasn't the right one for an introverted song like this, and having to go second surely doomed it. Just like the cardboard cutouts on stage, this one unfortunately fell flat. Serbia is next with Samo Misa Spava, or I Just Want to Sleep, an electropop song about being isolated from the world during the pandemic and needing to start living again. It's sung by Luke Black, who is accompanied by those guys, and also a giant robot, that is awesome. It qualified in the first semi-final, just barely coming in 10th place, and that trend unfortunately continued with the song not really getting a lot of votes from either the jury or the public, putting Serbia in 24th out of the 26 in the finals. The style is a bit too alternative for most of the jury and the public, which is a real shame because this song deserved a lot better. Not only are the Serbian lyrics amazing, jeez, the performance itself went hard. I never expected that having to unplug your backup dancers from a giant robot while its health bar depletes would be something I really needed in my life. And something that looks like this is a song about mental health? Amazing. I wish this placed as highly as last year's Consacta with Incopresano, which this song takes a lot of inspiration from. Latvia is next bringing Aya, which is somehow both a rock song and a lullaby, a pretty big contrast with the previous entry. It's sung by the group Southern Lights, and as the name would suggest, there were a lot of Southern Lights on screen. Yeah, I'm already running out of ideas. It got 11th place in the semis and didn't qualify, since the song just wasn't flashy enough to make it through. I mean, it was flashy because, be because of the lights, but you know what I mean. But I still want to praise it for having a lot more depth than you'd expect initially. It's based on a Latvian folk lullaby, and a lullaby being adapted into a song for Eurovision is already a really interesting concept, and they even sing it at the end. I think it unfortunately got lumped together with a lot of other generic sounding songs, which is why it barely didn't qualify. And yeah, initially it wasn't on my qualify list either, but it's grown on me, and I really wish that this did better. Now it's time for Portugal, aka the time for me to go absolutely insane. They've brought Ai Curaçao and... Do I even need to tell you what genre this is? Just look at it. So I know we've only discussed four songs so far, but we're already at my favorite one. I only cast one vote for every show that I am allowed to vote for, and Mimikat got my vote in the grand final. I like this one a lot. But judging at their score, I feel like I'm in a pretty small group. It passed the semis in 9th place and had to perform 2nd in the final, meaning that it got a pretty bad jury score and an absolutely awful televote. And so Portugal ended up in 23rd place. While the televote was definitely expected due to them having to go 2nd in the running order, Portugal didn't deserve to get gutted this much in the jury vote. Sure, the staging was very lacking, and broadcasters throwing some performers under the rug is going to be a bit of a trend, but I feel like it's perfectly compensated by the great vocals, the funny backup dancers, and of course, this. Which I've heard is called the Mimikat Walk? Okay, stop being funnier than me. The song being fully in Portuguese is also a great asset because it appeals to the crowd that likes songs showing off a country's culture, which includes myself. This really deserved better, but I guess anyone could say that about any song this year. Then it's Ireland with We Are One, a rock song that can be summarized by the title itself, representing Eurovision's goal of uniting Europe. No, Eurovision's goal is to make money, but I digress. It ended in 12th place in the first semi-final and thus it failed to qualify, and for the first time so far, I think I'll have to agree with that placement. That's not to say that Wild Youth did a bad job though, you can tell that a good amount of effort went into both the stage lighting and giving the song a warm feeling to get the crowd excited. What's really the problem here is that it's just a bit too warm. It blends in too easily with other sentimental pop songs. That makes it a nice contender to listen to on the radio, but at Eurovision where performances are half the battle, it's unfortunately not enough to overwhelm the crowd. Besides, songs about Eurovision isn't what's gonna win Eurovision, and 90% of the spectators just want to listen to good songs. Ireland really needs to get into some sort of voting block or experiment with a song it submits to take back their lead which was equal by Sweden this year. Every Eurovision needs the silly entry, and thankfully Croatia delivered this year with Mama Shte. To all of my beloved Americans watching this, it's better to just not ask any questions. This indie rock song is performed by Let3, a band that specializes in creating stuff like this and making it unironically good. It placed 8th in the first semi-final to get the qualification, and was blessed with being one of the last performances during the final. I don't know who allowed that to happen, and I also don't know if they should get a race or get fired. A song like this is naturally a huge flop in the jury vote, but an absolute success in the televote, meaning that they placed 13th overall. Since Let3 has to remain apolitical, the general 
general message is one against stupidity, and the references are very vague. But that doesn't mean that the song is only supposed to be a shitpost. It's a lot deeper than most of the ones performed, referring to the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Specifically, the psychopath is Putin and the tractor is Lukashenko. So even if it appears to be stupid, an anti-Russian song was to be expected. And this was probably done in the best way possible. And of course, cheer is a fun thing for the crowd to sing along to. Switzerland is next with Watergun, a ballad about playing with water guns and then playing with real guns when grown up. Overall, a cover piece. It plays 7th in the semis and 20th in the grand final. It's a little surprising actually, while it wasn't going to get a lot of votes from the televote anyways, Remo Foro's voice is probably the best one of the whole contest, so you'd expect a lot more votes from the jury. I guess the running order does have an effect on the jury. Or it's because of Sweden, but more on that later. It is pretty poetic for Switzerland to submit a song about being afraid of war after finally coming out of their neutral shell to denounce Russian aggression against Ukraine. Although I think people might be feeling a sort of ballad fatigue when it comes to Switzerland, especially when it doesn't really connect to the crowd very well in order to be memorable. It's just another ballad. And while that isn't a bad thing, again his voice is immaculate, it feels a bit samey. But hey, Switzerland making an anti-war statement is already mind-blowing, so it's got that going for it. Israel's Unicorn, sung by Noah Carell, was a pretty popular one to a lot of people's surprise. It's supposed to be a pop song, but I feel like the genre changes like five times throughout the whole thing. It's exhilarating, and that's likely what won over so many people. It placed third in both semis and the grand final, getting a lot of votes from both the jury and the televote. The song itself does feel a little bit generic, since songs about being capable on your own are pretty cliche. And like, can you really sing about standing on your own when you've got backup dancers like right there? But what the song lacks gets completely carried by the performance. It's insane how hyper the dancing is. This is just a telephoning magnet. In a way, it does feel a bit too constructed specifically for Eurovision, but that just means that it came out incredibly well. It's got sing-along lines, a repeatable hand motion that was even picked up by the 12-pointers, and feminism. But all I can say is, don't hate the player, they hate the game. Moldova seems to always bring songs that really appeal to the televoters, and this year is no different with a dance pop and folk song Suarele Shiluna. It's sung by Paja Parfeni, who also participated in the 2012 contest, where he placed 11th. This time around, his song got 5th in the semi-final and 18th in the grand final, which, like I said, is carried by the televoters. The Eurovision block that votes for cultural songs obviously went pretty wild for this, and a song being fully in Romanian helps it out a lot on that front. The sun and the moon are pretty universal symbols in different cultures, so it still feels very familiar, even if the folklore itself isn't connected to most of us. And when Sergio hits the flute? Hell yeah, let's get it! I think that the only reason why this didn't place any higher than 18th was because Finland attracted so many televotes that it left a lot of good performances such as these ones in the dust. But even so, please keep doing stuff like this Moldova, we love you! So Sweden is a pretty interesting one, because while every other country decided to send singers to the competition, Sweden sent a NUCLEAR BOMB! Gee, Sweden, maybe give the rest of us a chance? This is Loreen, previous winner of the ESC with her song Euphoria in 2012, and the mad lass pulled it off again this year with Tattoo, a heartfelt dance pop song with admittedly generic pop lyrics, but what is probably the best performance of the whole show. I mean, it's Loreen, what did you expect? In 2012, she pretty much changed Eurovision to actually value performances. Also, I like the way she says that to ooh ooh. I, th I think that's funny. This song plays second in the semi final and first in the grand final, but I'll go more in depth about the votes and the controversy that this song received later, because the crowd was a little bit iffy on her victory. I wasn't really on either Team Sweden or Team Finland, so I want to say that both of them deserve the win. Louine is a legend and doesn't deserve any of the hate she gets. And with this, Sweden has equaled Ireland's record of seven victories. Nice job! Azerbaijan is next up with Tell Me More, an indie pop song sung by Tural to Run X, having the advantage of harmonizing their voices more easily thanks to being twins, or something. <laughs> But unfortunately, it got 14th place in the semi, meaning that it didn't even come close to qualifying, only getting one point more than Malta. And yeah, I can kind of see why. I liked it quite a bit, it's a nice, warm, homey song, but because of that, it suffers from the same problem as Ireland. It's too comfortable, and doesn't try to do a whole lot. It would have fit perfectly with other cozy songs from a couple decades ago, but in 2023, the competition is way too stiff for something like this to have a chance of competing. I'll pour one out for you, Azerbaijan, maybe next year. And then there's Czechia with My Sister's Crown, a magical feeling folk pop song about gender equality and more generally about oppression. It's sung in sheesh, four languages? Which easily makes it the most diverse song in the entire contest. And as you may expect with the song being about oppression, and part of the song being sung in Ukrainian to show support for them, it's already banned in Russia. So you know that automatically makes it a good song regardless of where it's placed. 
It got 4th in the semi-final and 10th in the grand final. The band Vesna's greatest strength here is having a total of 6 members. With all of them singing throughout the song, wearing the same clothes and having the same braids, it gives them an almost cultish vibe, really making it stand out among the crowd. It also leaned heavily into the Slavic and Eastern European voting bloc to really make each Slavic nation proud of their own heritage. It's an excellent performance and I hope that Czechia can start getting some more good results like this in the future. Second to last is The Netherlands with Burning Daylight, a slow pop song about wanting to start a new life but wasting time to get it done. It didn't qualify for the finals and only got 13th place in the semi. I really can't help but feel bad for Mia Nikolai and Dion Cooper because they had to go through a lot of controversy to bring the song over to Eurovision since their earlier performances were not received well by Dutch media. And while thankfully they were able to get their act together for the ESC itself, there was still the underlying problem that the song was way too safe. It seems that the Dutch broadcaster really left them hanging in this regard. Also with Mia and Dion being relatively new when it came to singing together, they weren't able to perform as well as their mentor Duncan Lawrence when he won the 2019 contest with Arcade. It's sad to see them not qualify after all of the hard work they've put in, but I guess you win some, you lose some. And finishing off the first semi-final, Finland. And this also won the whole semi itself. The song is Cha Cha Cha, a song switching between metal and dance pop about getting drunk to overcome fears at a party. Not that I'd known anything about that, again I don't go to parties. And yeah, this was the audience's favorite, absolutely dominating both the semi-final and grand final televote. But it ended up placing second in the end. It's not hard to understand its popularity either. It's about drinking, it's completely in Finnish, the cha 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 convinces the crowd to sing along, and the performance itself is absolutely ridiculous in the best way possible. In the end, the jury vote was not enough to boost Geria's televote in order to beat Sweden, but he will always be the people's champion of this contest. All of Finland has gone completely green in support of this guy. I really hope to see more performances similar to this one in the future, and while it didn't get first place, second is absolutely nothing to scoff at for Finland, even if it's a huge disappointment to many people. Geria, you're a champ, we love you. The second semi-final took place on the 11th of May and featured... Okay, never mind, this opening is stupid, let's just get to the stuff. Denmark started off the second semi-final with Breaking My Heart, a catchy electropop song about a breakup. You know, we've had a good amount of pop songs about sentimentality and love and such so far, like the Netherlands, Azerbaijan and Ireland. And what they all have in common is that they didn't qualify. Yeah, this got 14th, which is the last place besides two null pointers. Riley himself is a pretty talented singer despite how you may look, but it definitely felt like that's also what Eurovision wanted you to focus on. His face. The camera was on him the entire time, almost as if trying to hide the lack of the core. The singer is charismatic, but the performance unfortunately just isn't. Definitely not for a Eurovision crowd that enjoys seeing something new. I feel like I've said that a lot, but it's the main reason why most of the songs that didn't qualify, didn't qualify. Having to go first is a little bit of a bummer as well though. A lot of people were also criticizing the robotic effect on the voice, but I personally didn't find it to be that distracting. And hey, it's our first representative from the Faroe Islands, so that's neat. Armenia performed second with the song Future Lover, a soul song about a future lover. It plays 6th in the semis and 14th in the grand final, a spot that the jury and the televote actually mostly agreed on for once. It's sung by Brunette, who's standing on this slope. Well, I didn't know that Eurovision fans and Mario Maker 2 fans had so much in common. I think a part of a minority who liked this song more than the average person, but I'm gonna blame that on my country voting for this en masse. The general consensus, however, is that the rap part is awesome, the Armenian at the end is awesomer, but the generic and clunky lyrics at the start of the song make it lose a bit of the potential that it could have had. It didn't bother me that much, I was more so focusing on the cool slope that looks really tasty. I don't know, I'm joking a lot, but I really like this one, and think that the performance did the song a lot more justice than the music video could. Next is Romania. Who did this to you? Okay, before I get ahead of myself, this song is Dejete, or Off and On, a rock song about a toxic relationship. It's sung by Theodore André, who despite obviously having incredible vocal talents, got the famous null points. Absolutely nothing. It's clear that Theodore used what he received to make the best performance he possibly could have, but unfortunately what he received wasn't much. The staging here is pretty awful and also feels quite random, not actually helping out the performance at all, instead just making the audience confused. From what I understand, Romania had some budget issues and wasn't able to give the best staging or even the best music, so similarly to the Netherlands, the Romanian broadcaster left him to his own devices. The music video in comparison has music that actually supports the song instead of leaving Theodore screaming in his mic all on his own, even if the staging is still a small disaster. But to mention something positive, it's mostly in Romanian, which is always cool. Estonia's performance is actually pretty special because it's, to my knowledge, the first time that they invited a ghost on stage. 
I mean, who else could be playing that piano? Yeah, that's what I thought. Bridges is a ballad song by Alika, which got 10th place in the semi-final and 8th place in the grand final. That's another pretty big discrepancy, but this time it's not the running order that messed with the placement, but instead the split between the jury and the televote. Her vocal performance is stunning, one of the best of the whole show, and the song deservedly got 5th place in the jury vote because of it. On the other hand though, ballads with generic lyrics are sure to put the audience to sleep before they could actually vote for this. And yeah, the first time I watched this, I wasn't a big fan of it either. But like, I wanted to like it so badly because I knew that the performance was good. Thankfully, after listening to it over and over again, I can now say that I like it. But the pitiful televote was still to be expected. I guess you could say that I like it, it. Belgium is up next with Because of You, a house pop song about wanting to be yourself, especially when it comes to the LGBTQ plus community, since the singer Gustav is gay himself. It placed 8th in its semi-final and surged up to 7th in the grand final. Just like Estonia, it's gap that can be explained by the jury vote. The song is very reminiscent of the 90s, so it seems that the elderly jury felt nostalgic and voted this one up pretty high. Although that's not to take away from the excellent staging and performance or anything, since it's still ranked around mid in the final televote. I know that praising my own country can be a bit tacky, but I mean, it's a song that's hard to dislike, since it pulls off the cozy feeling without being overly generic. But that's just it. It's hard to dislike. It's also kind of hard to love. It's perfectly fine on its own, but a middling placement was this song's destiny. Guys, look, the Televote placed this 12th and I placed this 11th. I'm not that biased. Please don't hurt me. Then it's Cyprus with Break a Broken Heart, a ballad about rising up after a tough relationship. So far we've had a lot of these pop ballads that were meticulously engineered to be catchy and be about an ending relationship. Like even when ignoring the first semi-final you've already got Denmark, Armenia and Romania already having song about this. And like I said those three weren't received the greatest. However I think that Andrew Lambrou was received the best out of them all, placing 7th in the semi and 12th in the grand final, although it's only slightly ahead of Armenia. You can chalk it up to both his vocals and the staging overall being superior to those other three, but of course being generic did hold it back a little bit. So all in all, it was a pretty dang good performance and I enjoyed it as well. And it's also cool how Andrew is the only contestant to go on stage barefoot. I would do the same, again if I had feet. Next is Iceland with p, -p, p power The p, -p, -p is not in the title, but I think this is the only legal way to pronounce it. It's a p, -p, -p powerful electro p, -p, -p pop song by Dilio. It failed to qualify in the semi-final at 11th place. I was a little bummed about this one, because I immediately placed it in my qualify list. She has one of the better voices of the whole show, and the like martial art kicks she does throughout the p -p -p performance are great and add a lot of character without needing a lot of staging. So what weighed this one down is a common trend of it's generic. It's in direct competition with Armenia, Estonia and Georgia all being female solos that rely mostly on vocals instead of the core, which makes it hard to justify voting for this. But I don't know, I still like this one, and I don't see why this didn't qualify. Oh, that's why! Then there's Greece with What They Say, a quiet pop song that also kind of becomes energetic because Victor Vernikos is jumping around all over the place. Honestly, relatable. The song placed 13th in the semi and so it wasn't able to qualify. It's another song about making a comeback after the pandemic, just like Serbia's, but done in a much more mainstream way that made it kind of fall flat. I'm probably not alone in feeling a little confused after the performance ended, because while the lyrics are deep in and of themselves, they don't feel very connected. After one listen, I couldn't tell you what the song was about. That's also combined with Victor only being 16 years old and probably feeling pretty nervous about being on stage, but that does mean that he'll have a good career ahead of him, which he completely deserves. Like, I am 18 and I'm wasting my life away studying history like a loser! Actually, education is one of the most important things that life can give you in order to develop your skills. Stay in school, kids. Unless you're this guy, then you don't have to stay in school. <laughs> Poland. Oh boy. So this is Solo, a pop song. And by pop, I mean really, really, really pop. It placed 3rd in the semis but dropped to 19th in the final, which is because the jury vote absolutely decimated this. And for good reason. Like, I've been talking about how generic songs don't work in Eurovision, but this song is so generic that the integer overflowed and looped back around to qualifying. Besides that, the singer Blanca got into a lot of controversy, because the jury vote of the national final of Poland to decide the song they sent to Eurovision was allegedly rigged to have Blanca win instead of Jan with his excellent song Gladiator. And that incident led to her being hated, which also led to her getting completely memed on, most notably with the opening word of the song being mocked as Beba, which is a meme that she actually ended up embracing, and she decided to make a lot of improvements to her vocals as well as include a dance break. The difference between her performance in the national final and the grand final is like night and day, it's insane. So while we don't really know what happened behind closed doors, I can still somewhat respect her for actively improving the song to the point where it doesn't completely suck now. Time for Slovenia, they've brought Carpe Diem, a rock song about just having fun, or like the proverb, seizing the day. 
It's sung by Joker Out, a band keeping Slovenia's streak of sending in just Slovenian songs alive. It placed fifth in the semi-final, allowing it to qualify. Thank God, because I was sitting in my chair with nine countries already confirmed in the grand final, just repeating Slovenia over and over again in my head until they got announced to everyone's relief. Yeah, just like Belgium's, this is a really hard song to dislike. But unlike Belgium's, it's really easy to also love it. Just look at that like to dislike ratio. This song is just fun. All you really need to know is that these five guys are having a blast on stage without any burgers or fries, and that is deservedly going to get many votes. What do you mean this only plays 21st? Slovenia is also among the ones sacrificed to funnel votes into Finland, since the vibes of these songs very much overlap, especially because they're both sung in their native languages. But even the jury sat on this one because it isn't pop. This is what Ireland tried to do, but better and not forced. Next up is Georgia with the song Echo, an electropop song by Iru. Let me tell you, after almost falling asleep to the admittedly boring entries of Poland and Greece, and a simple yet fun entry of Slovenia, Iru's blaring voice immediately woke me up from my slumber and sent me to heaven, to hell and back. In the meantime, only one second had passed. This placed 12th in the final and was thus unable to qualify, which is pretty unlucky. While the vocals are bombastic and the staging is memorable, something disastrous must have happened to the lyrics. There's like one coherent sentence in here, as if Georgia played 52 pick up with the lyrics, and they only picked up 40 of the words. I think that if the song was in Georgian instead of English, it would have actually had a good shot at qualifying, but something like this just doesn't connect with the audience at all. It leaned into the same Yas screen energy as Norway, but this tweet could only get eyebrow raising emojis. Little Sam Marino submitted Like an Animal, an alt rock song that I can't really describe because if I do, YouTube will kick down my door again. This is the only other song that alongside Romania got null points, and so wasn't able to qualify for the final. It makes sense, San Marino has a pretty bad track record regarding their Eurovision placements, and while I like how they're sending in a lot of daring songs, I don't think that's right up everyone's pop loving alley. But Peak Jacks did a great job on stage, clearly showing that they were capable of setting up a good performance. I'm sure that San Marino will get back up again to give us something as fearless next year. Then there's Austria with Who the Hell is Edgar, a pop song that I genuinely don't think I could do justice in a short description. The singers, Teja and Selena, wrote the song together at a songwriting camp in Czechia as a satire on the music industry. Some of the critiques include ghostwriters that write texts or songs in the name of others, female songwriters having to prove themselves more than male songwriters, and only getting $0.003 per stream. Once again, similar vibes to Constructas in Copresano. Combine that with silly dance moves and a very catchy line to sing along to, and this became one of the favorites to win the whole shebang. With that being said, holy moly did this get robbed. It placed second in the semi-final but only 15th in the grand final. All because someone decided to make them go first in the running order, putting them among the bottom countries in the televote. Whoever made that decision should be fired into the sun. At least the jury got them all the way up there. And I feel like Thea and Selena tried their best to appear during intervals to make people remember them, and it unfortunately didn't work. I hope that this won't deter countries from sending songs like this. The song is a gem, and I send my condolences to Austria. This was just unfair. Albania is next with Duye, a folk pop song about the struggle of a family's unity. That theme is very well supported by Albina being able to sing with her own family members of the family Kalmendi, which is pretty damn awesome. It placed 9th in the semi-final and 22nd in the grand final, with most of the votes coming from the televoters. It's once again a song that's well appreciated by the people who like cultural songs. It's a classic piece of Balkan music sung entirely in Albanian, and even with incredible vocals and staging to boot. And considering that I also praised Portugal for this, and I voted for Portugal, this is the act that I voted for in the second semi. But it's still a you like it or you don't kind of song, because not everyone is going to be into this style, especially not the individualist Europe. Second to last is Lithuania with the song Stay, a pop song with some elements of folk in the staging specifically. It placed 4th in the semi-final and got a pretty good 11th place in the grand final. This is a nice improvement on Monica Linkiti's result in 2015 when she got 18th place. I feel like this is a good middle ground between both the jury and the televote, the former enjoying one of the better vocal performances, and the televoters enjoying the staging with all of its pagan culture. But the main reason why this song popped off is because of the Shuto Tuto being very fun to sing along to. It's likely supposed to be calming as well, since it's a Lithuanian folk chant used while dancing in religious circles, like they're doing in the performance itself. I don't have a strong opinion on it, but I completely understand why so many people liked it. It's heartfelt, soothing, simple, but still unique. And ending off the second semi-final, it's Australia with Promise, a progressive rock song with some electronic rock and metal sections. It received first place in the semi-final, but dropped down to ninth in the grand final due to a pretty poor public vote. 
Voyager is a pretty experienced band and they were able to show it off with a bold performance that's sure to be remembered for a long time. That's also probably why Australia dropped so much in the grand final, because they went last in the semis running order. The entire performance is just grandiose, with the freaking genre changes, the catchy chorus that the crowd loves to sing, the fierce head bopping, it's a song and performance that just feels very Australian. Considering that Australia may not return to Eurovision after this, I'm glad that at least this will be what we ended on. An absolute banger, literally. But in any case, I do hope Australia can keep coming back in the future. The grand final took place on the 13th of May, featuring the 12 qualifiers from both semi-finals, the Big Five, and the previous winner, Ukraine. Alongside the voting, which will get its own section, the flag parade is also worth discussing. But let's first finish up talking about every song. Only the Big Five and Ukraine remain, after all. France is up first with the song Évidemment. It's a style known as chanson, a song that uses French lyrics with a lot of wordplay and poetry, but in this case it's a lot more modern. The song ended up in 16th place with the jury and televote mostly agreeing on this placement. But it's still a little surprising since this is one of the fan favorites before the whole show started. Lazara definitely has enough charisma to the point where it doesn't really matter if she's standing on a taller podium without a lot of staging, but it still feels like it lacks a little bit. Leaning into the Frenchness was a good play after their previous Breton song didn't do so well and as usual it sounds very charming, but I seriously can't get myself to vote for it because it just feels like such voting bait. But I mean again, don't hate the player, hate the game. Besides that, the crowd naturally loves the chorus, and the long note of the climax was done perfectly, so all in all, it's a respectable placement. Second is Spain with Ea Ea. Continuing with the unique styles, this is New Flamenco, combining Spanish folklore with modern styles. The song got 17th place, but unlike France, it got carried by the jury vote because it received last place in the televote. And even with that, I cannot but wonder why Blanca Paloma didn't receive more jury votes, since she's like an actual set designer and costume designer. I mean, that's the main reason why the televote tanked, because it's so complicated. Although also the staging and lyrics have a religious tint to them, and flamenco music isn't really what the Eurovision audience is really used to, and I unfortunately have to admit that when I first listened to it, I felt the exact same way, as if it was just too cluttered. I've since changed my mind completely though, since the lyrics are quite thoughtful and the synth in the back is fun to listen to and adds a lot of modernity to the song, and I think it's pretty mesmerizing and I wish that it did a little bit better. This year, Italy has brought Due Vite, a ballad about living a second life within your own unconscious. It seems to be really difficult for Italy to send actually bad songs to Eurovision, especially this year with Eurovision 2013 veteran Marco Mengoni on stage. It ended up placing fourth in the grand final, slightly more valued by the jury. There isn't much to say about the performance considering that sentimental Italian ballads will always have a dedicated audience regardless of what the staging or vocals are like, but of course Marco's performance is still excellent thanks to his experience which made it stand out in the jury vote. But what I was mostly focused on is the two people bouncing back and forth in the background. I don't know how they're doing this, I want to know how they're doing this, and also how do I get this job, and also how much does it pay? Probably more than being a YouTuber. Ukraine is up next with Heart of Steel, an urban and electronic song. Ukraine has played around a bit with songs about Ukraine's struggle for independence, which is what led them to victory in 2016, but since Europe is now pretty much aware of the whole situation, this song goes for a more general approach of nuclear warfare. Though it was also influenced by the siege of the Azovstal steel plant, it's not specifically Ukrainian, but more of a warning against nuclear weapons. The band Zavochi even had to perform the national final next to an underground metro to stay safe. This approach was a pretty smart move because Zelensky was not allowed to make an appearance this year to call for help due to Eurovision trying to remain apolitical. So singing about nuclear war in general would get the message across without completely breaking the rules. In the end, the song came in 6th place, getting more televotes than the jury vote. While I don't think that's necessarily because of solidarity voting, because the song naturally appeals to modern audiences, there probably were a couple solidarity votes due to Tvorti's hometown of Ternopil getting bombed by Russia right before the performance. It's petty, and not even a strategic goal, and because of that I feel like it breaks the Geneva Convention, stating that extensive destruction not justified by military necessity is a war crime. I did make a video on that, but of course I'm not an authority or know anything when it comes to this. Regardless, I again send my best wishes to the Ukrainian people, and using Eurovision to send a political message is completely justified in my opinion. We're almost there, Germany is the second to last with blood and glitter, a mix between progressive rock and gothic metal. So what do you get when you combine Germany, who has been placing bottom or almost bottom several years in a row, and a music genre that both the jury and the public dislikes because it isn't pop or ballad? Oh come on guys, not again. Yeah, Germany once again places last, and the sad part is that this time, they didn't even deserve it. The song is genuinely good, the performance is intense, the outfits are funny. You'd think that at least the jury would recognize the talent and give this one some points, but no, last. The band Lord of the Lost does seem to be taking the loss in stride though, which is awesome of them. I truly hope that Germany doesn't look at what Poland did this year in order to get that many votes. Stay strong. 
And at last, the moment you've all been waiting for. It's the United Kingdom. I Wrote a Song is a Eurodance track, a sort of combination of dance, electronic, and rap. Although I guess you could say that it's pop because of all of the pop art in the background. Yeah, that joke isn't that good. May Muller had a lot to live up to after Sam Ryder's second place last year, but with her going last in the running order and with the crowd's excessive cheering after the song, I'm sure this got a wonderful placement. Second to last. Oh, UK. Yeah, most of those people cheering are Brits themselves and couldn't actually vote for their own country. May still has a lot of work to do to improve her vocals since they felt like they got lost in the track itself. And like, sure, it wasn't my favorite either, but with the crowd being British and with May's general confidence on stage, it made for a pretty fun closing performance, even if it was going to do poorly anyways. I would prefer it if the UK had actually sent a performance that had a chance of winning, since this was probably done due to the cost of hosting, but oh well. But all of those weren't the only ones performed at the grand final. First up, Kalush Orchestra, the previous winners for Ukraine, performed an improved version of their winning song Stefania, as well as Voices of a New Generation. It had some more instruments in it, as well as some English vocals, once again hammering on the theme. Afterwards, the flag parade started, which is a ceremony showing off every participant, as well as some previous performances of the host country. These were Go A with Shum, placing 5th for Ukraine in 2021, Jamala with 1944, placing 1st for Ukraine in 2016, Tina Karol's Show Me Your Love, placing 7th for Ukraine in 2006, and finally Verka Serdushka with Dancing Lasha Dumbai, placing second for Ukraine in 2007. But I know that a lot of you are interested in flags, so let's get into that now. Welcome back to the- no, we're not doing that. Everything went like usual, but there were two things that stood out. First, Voyager carried not only the Australian flag, but the Australian Aboriginal flag as well. That's coincidentally the same analogy that I made at the start of my Every Flag Explained video, and it's nice of them to show their support. Second, Marco Mangoni emerged with both the Italian flag and the Progress Pride flag. This isn't something new or anything. Many contestants have carried any LGBTQ plus flag with them in a flag parade before. I do think it's notable though because this is probably also a wake-up call for Italy to legalize same-sex marriage, which they actually haven't done yet. Wow, Italy, we're supposed to be the enlightened West and yet we're losing to... Mexico? We are embarrassing. Marco himself hasn't actually stated if he's LGBTQ plus or not, but I think he wants to keep that private either way. And that concludes everything that I wanted to mention about the performances. Now, let's get into some nerd shit. The voting is always going to be interesting to take a look at considering that it not only has to do with the quality of the songs, but also with cultural relations, which I believe my audience is more so into than what I've been talking about before. So let's discuss some of the voting, shall we? Also, if you want to know even more than what I'm gonna say here, you should check out ESC Tom's channel, whose voting analyses are a lot more thorough than mine. Also, also, it'll be hard for me to give a cultural or demographic explanation for all of these, so if you know a bit more about a specific country's voting patterns, then let me know in the comments. Now, let's start with the first semi-final, in which France, Germany, and Italy could vote as well. Here's a bar graph of the amount of points that each country received. The first three are pretty logical since they also ended up being the top three of the grand final. Portugal and Serbia got similarly screwed over by the running order in both the semi and the grand final because they both had to go very early in both contests. But Norway and Croatia actually experienced a big jump in televote in the grand final since their running order there was a lot more favorable. Of the 10 qualifiers, the top 9 clearly stand out and deserve to qualify. Serbia, however, is actually only 3 points ahead of Latvia, which makes Latvia the most robbed non-qualifier of the contest. During the semis, the amount of votes are aren't actually revealed, only who qualified and who didn't, but the detailed televotes are revealed later on, so let's take a look at those as well. Norway got points across the board besides from the rest of the world. Kind of strange considering that Queen of Kings does have a lot of international appeal, I believe it's somewhat popular in the US as well, so I'd say the running order is the culprit. Malta's 3 points came from Israel's 2 and the rest of the world's 1. Getting such low points means that those votes are probably just because of music preference. Serbia's points were middling, but Croatia's standards would push them over the edge to qualify. That's a voting block. Latvia has a similar distribution to Serbia, but with the bulk of their points coming from an 8 from the rest of the world. Latvia isn't really a country with a lot of diaspora, so maybe it's just because of universal values? I don't know. Portugal's scores were pretty alright, but most importantly they got 12s from Switzerland and France. France likes voting up Romance languages, but even though Switzerland is partly French speaking, it's not a majority, so it might just be preference. It seems that Latin America also carried the rest of the world vote here to give them 6 points. Ireland's highest points were 3s from Norway and Malta, pretty low but likely a small bit of cultural influence. Croatia got 12 points from Serbia, again because of the voting block, but also because the subject probably hit close to home. Also a nice 10 points from Germany, where it probably also hits close to home. Switzerland is similar to Norway, getting alright points across the board, but nothing from the rest of the world. It's the only ballot in this batch that isn't considered to be lacking, and might have attracted voters who like those. Israel was pretty popular in general, getting 12s from Moldova, Azerbaijan, Czechia, and the rest of the world. The former three I want to chuck up the preference, and the latter was likely boosted by Jewish diaspora. Really only Finland gave the low score at 1. Moldova got 12s from 
Portugal and Italy, who might appreciate the Romance language, which is also why France gave it a 10. But its wild nature probably had more influence. That's why the country represented by wild youth gave them a 10, am I right? Sweden obviously received a good amount of points from literally everyone, but they got 12s from Malta and the Netherlands. You'd expect more, but that's because Finland ran away with most of them. Azerbaijan scored a 4 and got half of those from Latvia. Again, low score, so probably just preference. Czechia also didn't really receive too many low scores from anyone, and they got a 12 from Finland. Could always be preference, but maybe it's also because of the anti-Russian message and Finland joining NATO. The Netherlands only scored 7, but it's more scattered, so there's not much to say. It's like Switzerland, but not as well received. Finland ran away with most of the 12 points, getting them from Norway, Latvia, Ireland, Croatia, Israel, Sweden, and Germany. It really only makes sense to look at the lowest score, which was Moldova giving them a 6. I don't think it's because of cultural differences though, since Moldova gave Sweden a 10. Of the two semi-finals, this one is thought to be the stronger one, and with these votes you can clearly see why. Finland took 7 of the 12 points, while Israel took 4 of the 12 points, which didn't leave many opportunities for the rest. That's something that's pretty visible if you compare the two semis, because Serbia qualified with 37 points, while Iceland in the other semi didn't qualify with 44 points. So even though Serbia got less, it matters as because most points went to the top anyways. And if you look at the grand final televote, we exclusively see either automatic qualifiers or semi-final 1 contestants in the top 7, until it gets broken up by Poland. It's especially sad for Latvia, who not only was close to qualifying, but also had to go early in the running order and was thus unfortunately overshadowed by the big hitters. But one good aspect of their dominance is that block voting mattered a lot less, since getting points across the board is absolutely crucial to qualify. Meanwhile, Serbia and Latvia relied on big points from just one or two countries, which put them lower. So in the end, block voting in this semi was a lot less present. The rest of the world vote didn't really shake up the results, although they did give more votes proportionally to Latvia and Portugal. But Portugal already qualified with a large gap between them and Serbia, and Latvia didn't qualify either way. As for the second semi-final, here's another bar graph. Austria, Albania, Lithuania, and Australia were able to take advantage of their late running order to get a lot of points. Australia, and especially Austria, weren't so lucky in the grand final and so didn't get as many points as was expected. None of them really gained a large jump in televote in the grand final, as you could see from the top 7 that I showed earlier. Estonia was probably the biggest winner though, considering how many jury votes they received in the grand final, and in that sense, Poland was the biggest loser. The 10 qualifiers are a bit more fair than in the first semi, since 10th place Estonia is pretty far ahead of 11th place. Iceland. Also, keep in mind that for the detailed voting, San Marino did not have a valid televote and instead used their backup jury vote. Denmark did not get null point, but they were very close, since the only points they got were from Iceland, who immediately gave them a 6. Definitely one of the more obvious cases of block voting. Armenia got pretty good points across the board and snagged a 12 from Belgium and Georgia. As for Georgia, the historical and geographical similarities are apparent. When it comes to Belgium though, it somewhat has to do with the historical relations between Western Europe and Armenia, which is even more apparent in France. But let's just say that Belgium has a notable Armenian diaspora. A 10 from the best of the world also makes sense because most Armenians live outside of Armenia. Romania. Estonia had some trouble with the televoters due to sending a ballot, but they actually got points from every single country, even if it's mostly 2s and 3s. 10 points from San Marino due to the backup jury votes, 10 points from Lithuania due to the Baltic voting bloc, and also 8 points from Ukraine. Ukraine's votes probably went out to the countries that are most so supporting them in the conflict, and Estonia is one of the front runners in that regard due to the Tallinn pledge, which confirmed some European countries' resolve to defend Ukraine. Belgium's points were mid for the most part, besides getting a 12 from Austria. This is kind of weird, Belgium and Austria have never really been in a voting block, and in the grand final televote they didn't even get anything from Austria. Of course they have linguistic ties, and Belgium was ruled by Austria for a while during the early modern age, but besides that I don't know how to explain it. Cyprus's points were also pretty middling, but they got the 12 points from Greece, who could have seen that coming, and also 10 points from Armenia because Armenians and Greeks have historical and cultural ties. The big standout this year though was Australia giving them 10 points, which is because Andrew Lambrou is Australian. He even participated in the X Factor Australia once and even tried to represent Australia at Eurovision in 2022. So these votes were given out because of recognition. Iceland didn't score all too well and got most of their points from Denmark's 12. Just like with Denmark, classic voting block. Greece scored very poorly and only got a 12 from Cyprus and 2 from Armenia. Again, who could have seen this coming? Poland received a high amount of votes from most countries here due to the nature of the song, but most notably 12s from Ukraine and Lithuania. Not so coincidentally, the three countries making up the Lublin Triangle. Slovenia received a pretty good amount of votes all around and picked up 12s from Romania, Poland and Spain. A pretty diverse set of countries. Spain is usually a big fan of Romania, but with Romania's performance this year being 
bad. And Portugal not being in the semi, I suppose they looked at Slovenia and were like, yeah, close enough. Or maybe it's because of the name of the song, Carpe Diem being Latin, which Romance languages like Spanish and Romanian appreciate. As for Poland, it could also be Slavic similarities. Or maybe it's because these countries just appreciate fun. I mean, Spain is a top tourist destination for that reason. I don't know, those are just my small theories and are probably wrong. Let me know what you think. Georgia didn't get a lot of votes, but they did get a 12 from Armenia, making those two a perfect pair. More on that later. But yeah, same reason as before. San Marino. Austria got a good amount of points from everyone, which is mostly because of the running order and the song just being good in general. Although the only 12 points they got were from Australia. I'm sure they saw the similar name and thought they were voting for themselves. <laughs> Albania's points really reflect the song being a you love it or you hate it kind of thing, since there weren't a lot of midpoints but instead either pretty high or low ones. They received 12 points from Slovenia, who they are kind of in a Balkan voting block with, but I'd say if Serbia or Croatia were present then Albania would have received less. Most notably though, they got a 12 from the rest of the world vote, which makes a lot of sense I think. The rest of the world has a lot more collectivist cultures compared to Europe which has more individualist cultures, so the rest of the world would likely vote for a performance about a family. Lithuania didn't get a lot of points from some countries, but the ones who did give points to Lithuania usually gave them mid to high amounts. San Marino and the UK gave them a 12. Again, San Marino used the jury vote so this is likely just about vocals. The UK has always given more points to Lithuania on average, although I'm not exactly sure why. Australia got a lot of points from everyone, but their 12 points came from Estonia, Iceland and Albania. Nordic countries like Iceland and kinda Estonia are a lot more into metal, and while the song is mostly prog rock, it contains some metal parts. Albania surprised me though, and I don't have any theories besides the running order, so let me know about that one as well. This is considered to be the weaker of the two semi-finals, and that's apparent with the 12 points being much more spread out than in the first semi. Australia and Slovenia gained the most at 3. Also with Romania and San Marino getting squat, and Denmark and Greece only really being saved from the same fate by cultural ties, it made the bottom especially weak. But in this case, the top 10 countries were in dominant, they were all fighting for the same position, unlike in the first semi where you had a few dominant ones, so this semi was a lot more healthier in that regard. The rest of the world vote didn't have much of an effect this time either, but since they gave their 12 points to Albania, it might influence what some countries do in the future, perhaps sending more songs that appeal outside of Europe. Because there's nothing stronger than family. Okay, my producers just told me that that meme died two years ago. Oh well. But now, the moment you've all been waiting for, the finale vote, where everyone waits in suspense for the votes to be revealed, with the performance either popping off or slow clapping. Let's take a look at the jury vote first, since it accounts for the first half of the votes, and Jesus Christ! So, I've been dancing around this for quite a while now, but I think it's about time that we have this talk. As you can see, the winner of the jury vote was Sweden, getting 340 points. The runner-up, Israel, received 177 points. Sweden got double the amount of points that Israel got. So yeah, if you're out of the loop and are wondering why people are so upset over the results, this is why. The jury gave Sweden a lead that was in practice almost impossible for them to lose, and because Finland was the public's favorite, it led to a pretty big outrage. So how could this have happened? Well, you might say that the jury is voting for Loreen because it's Loreen. And yes, music industry professionals are definitely more prone to defend other established individuals, but that's not all there is to it. Or you might believe the conspiracy theory that the juries were bribed to vote for Sweden so that ABBA could appear in Sweden next year on their 50th anniversary of performing Waterloo at Eurovision, which is something that many people would tune in for. Personally, I don't believe it since it's a huge undertaking, and if even one person spilled the tea then Eurovision would have a pretty big credibility issue. So no, instead I'd like to point you to a video made by The Peace Around, because she gives a boatload of statistics that really help clear things up. I'm not going to spoil everything she said because you should watch the video yourself, link in the description. But the main thing I want to take away is this. The average age of the contestants is 29, and the average age of the juries is 45. Meanwhile, about 38% of the performances are pop, while about 55% of the juries are pop experts. Demographics of the juries and the contestants just don't line up, and it's a reason why countries like Germany, Albania, and especially Spain got destroyed by the jury vote. They're not pop, and they don't appeal to the right age range. Now, admittedly, this does mean that Finland actually wasn't even undervalued by the jury. In fact, Finland received more votes than what you would expect from the jury. So it's not like Sweden was overvalued and Finland was undervalued. No, Finland was overvalued, and Sweden was over, over, overvalued. So how do we fix this? I don't know. Obviously, getting rid of the jury is a pretty bad idea. I mean, there's a reason why the contest scrapped the 100% public system, but I'm not an expert on this at all, so I won't give you any offers. What others have been saying, though, is to reduce the proportions of the jury vote, make the juries more transparent, have more than five jurors per country, diversify the juries across different music genres, or even make some changes to how the running order is decided. If you want a bit more of a deep dive into the Sweden-Finland thing, I recommend this video by Eleanor Nightwalker. It's thorough and very well researched. But like, whatever happens in the future, please don't do this again.
After Finland got their first 12 from Norway, the public started chanting cha 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 whenever Sweden or Finland picked up any 12s thereafter, culminating when Lithuania gave 12 to Sweden. It's kind of unsportsmanlike, unfortunately. Keep in mind that the presenters are just trying to do their job and shouldn't have to calm down a rowdy crowd such as this. On the other side, though, these people did have to pay money in order to vote for Keria, so having the result almost be predetermined has made it an unnecessary loss of money. I still don't condone it, but oh well. It really sucks because Lorene's legacy after 2012 was perfect, and it would have been best if she didn't compete, because this might cause a bit of a stain on her legacy, you know? It's like how YouTubers keep posting videos way past their golden years, and you have to watch as they slowly decay into irrelevancy. That's why I have that on dying in two years. For legal reasons, that's a joke. But in any case, people love an underdog, so at least the silver lining is that Keria has been catapulted to stardom, and deservedly so. And like, at least the crowd is just naturally uncontrollable. Lazara, you had no right to flip us off like that. But whatever, let's get rid of the moody atmosphere and talk about something else. The Greek jurors gave 4 points to Cyprus. And the whole world stood still. This is actually a good thing, because sure, it's less funny than the two giving each other 12s the whole time, but that was something that really damaged the credibility of the contest. This is a step in the right direction. I'm proud of you, Greece. Yeah, besides that, there's not much to talk about, since analyzing the televoting is more interesting in terms of voting blocks, so let's wrap this up. Portugal somehow gave Australia 12 points. Voyager was not expecting it and they were all accidentally eating bread in their victory pop-off. What do you mean that's not important? Eurovision is serious business. Anyways, let's cycle the televote as well now, but this one doesn't really get as hype of reveals as the jury vote, so we're gonna go back to looking for cultural links. Austria got decimated by the televote, only receiving 16 points due to the running order like I said before, and the only substantial amount of points they got was from Australia. I could make the same joke here, but I'll spare you all the slow clap. Portugal's televote was similarly lackluster, also 16, but they got some votes from their Romance language fans. Is Romance language a word? Well, it is now. Switzerland also did pretty poorly with 31 points, but still got some scattered votes, most notably from Sweden's 8. I guess it's countries that start with SW Solidarity. Poland's televote was pretty good at 81 points, although they didn't get many points from a lot of countries. They did pick up 12 points from Ukraine, which we've already kind of discussed. Serbia did poorly with another 16, but gained 7 from Croatia and 6 from Slovenia. Balkan block. France got points from many countries, but they were always pretty low amounts, so just 50 in total. Armenia gave them the most points at 10 due to the aforementioned historical ties. Cyprus received 58, which is respectable, but what isn't respectable is at 12 points from Greece. Again, who could have seen this coming? Spain received the least televote points at 5, but I feel like the crowd was more upset than Blanca was, because she He's a queen. Anyways, 3 came from Portugal because of the block, and 2 came from the rest of the world, so likely some Latin American influence. Sweden got 243 points, which is the second largest amount, but they didn't actually pick up any 12s because people didn't want them to win. So funnily enough, the only country that didn't give anything to Sweden was... Finland. Yeah, I think they understood what they had to do to win. Albania got 59 points, still getting a nice amount from the rest of the world, but Switzerland was the one giving them a 12 this time. Switzerland often gives many points to Albania, which is not reciprocated by Albania, which is because Switzerland has one of the largest Albanian diasporas in the world, making up almost 3% of the Swiss population. Italy had a pretty large amount of points at 174, with 12s from both Malta and Albania. Malta is obvious due to their close proximity and Malta having been a territory of several Italian states in the past. You wouldn't expect Italy and Albania to be close Eurovision friends, but they actually give each other more points on average, which is also due to close historical and cultural ties. Estonia only received 22 points from the televote due to having ballot syndrome, so the points they did get came from Finland, the other Baltics, and the Netherlands, all of which they are culturally close to. Finland dominated the televote at 376 points, no country gave them lower than a 6. This does make it a little hard to comment on because everyone liked them anyways. Czechia only got 35 points, and most of it came from Finland giving them a 10. And again, I think the NATO accession had a lot to do with it, considering the subject of Czechia's performance. Australia's low 21 points were mostly given by Finland's 8 and Estonia's 6. Again, they lack medal. Belgium got 55 points, mostly mid amounts from a few countries, but a 10 from the Netherlands, which is a block vote. Armenia got 53 points, but just like in the semi, they got many votes from a few and nothing from the majority. And as you'd expect, those 12 points came from France and Georgia. Moldova got a nice 76 points and they're pretty scattered overall, but with 12 points from Italy and Romania. Italy didn't change from the semi, and of course Romania will always vote for Moldova. Ukraine got a 189 points. And again, some of them were definitely solidarity points due to the bombing of Ternopil and the recent surge in the Ukrainian diaspora, but they still got deserved 12 points from four countries. Moldova, proving my point from the other Eurovision video, Poland for reasons I've discussed a lot already, Czechia is similar, although they were also on the OG Russia's unfriendly countries list, and also Portugal, which might be because of diaspora, but I'm not sure. Norway got the third largest amount of televote points at 216, getting pretty good scores from almost every country besides Lithuania who gave them nothing, but most of the points still came from the Nordics, with Finland's 12, as well as Denmark's and Sweden's 10s. 
As usual, Germany didn't get many points, just 15, but they did get them from fellow German-speaking Switzerland and Austria, as well as metal-loving Finland. Lithuania got 46 points, but this also got carried by a few countries, specifically Latvia, the UK and Ireland giving 10s. Latvia is block voting, but again the UK and Ireland love giving Lithuania a lot of points, and I'm not sure why, let me know. Israel got a large 185 points, with 12s coming from their bloc members of Azerbaijan, Armenia and Cyprus, but also from the rest of the world, likely due to Jewish diaspora. Slovenia got 45 points, a bit more scattered, so only a 12 from bloc member Croatia. Croatia themselves did way better in the televote with 112 points. But even so, their only 12 came from Slovenia, again. And finally, the UK with a measly 9 points, having to rely on their former colony Malta and actually Ukraine. Perhaps they're thankful for the UK hosting the show in their stead. And also because Ukraine really likes Boris Johnson. Now let's look at some of what I'll call perfect pairs, aka countries that give each other 12 points. But since Finland ate up most of the 12 points, there aren't actually that many of them. They're Poland and Ukraine, Finland and Norway, and Croatia and Slovenia. Pretty classic voting block pairs. The only times that the jury and the tele voters agreed on who got the 12 points was with Armenia and Azerbaijan giving 12s to Israel, Czechia giving 12s to Ukraine, and Norway and Sweden giving 12s to Finland. Besides that, the discrepancy between the jury vote and tele vote was an absolute dumpster fire, as you must have already noticed. I don't need to talk about important things. It's called curing Eurovision depression. Get real. For me? Oh. How about I become an insider by making a video like this every year? Exactly, that's why it's perfect. No, I hate children. So, considering that this is a video essay, there has to be a conclusion that truly wraps up everything I said before. Yeah, no, I've got nothing. I guess as a newcomer here, I should say that I really enjoyed watching the contest. I mean, proportionally to the time I spent on this video, watching Eurovision for the first time was like 1% of my time, but regardless, I don't know what the previous Eurovisions were like, but I hope to have some more free time in the summer so that I can check out some of those grand finales, and I look forward to it. And whether or not the EBU will change the way voting works for the next contest, congratulations to both Lorene and Keria for their amazing performances and victories in the jury vote and the vote respectively. But if you want to ask me personally, then I think the country that should have won is... Liechtenstein.